Wow, Lord, we bless you today. Nobody like you. Nobody like you. Father, we honor you and every attribute that you are, not just the, the what you can do, but the who you are today, the who you are. We are infatuated with you. We are captured by you. Our hearts are just enveloped by your love and by your goodness, by your very character and nature. To peer into those eyes, those eyes of love, those eyes of fire, to have been brought into a place where we can know you intimately. We can know you and you can know us. What an honor it is to know you in this way. What incredible freedom. I've never known such love. I've never known such joy. I've never known such peace as to know you. Thank you for the one-on-one -on -one moments. Thank you for the prayer closet. Thank you for the times driving down the 401 and the presence of the Lord fills the car in a tangible, weighty way. Thank you that you're not a God that's afar off, but you're tangible, the manifest presence of God, the Shekinah glory, the Kabod glory of God. You manifest yourself. You love to reveal yourself to us. You love to speak. You love to embrace. You're just the best. <laughs> We've found the treasure. Or should I say the treasures found us? There's no going back. No going back. My heart this morning is really for uh, preparing us for uh, the coming weekend. Um, you know, there, there is such a thing as a kairos moment. And it's, it's a moment in time where God has appointed something to happen. And there's a lot of glory in living our day-to-day -day lives and living in His presence and, um, you know, hearing His voice and just the, the constant communion that we've been called into. But there are moments where things shift. There are appointed times and there are seasons and there are kairos moments in which God just seems to say, hey, on this day, at this time, uh, something extraordinary is going to happen. We're going to take a step forward. I'm going to deal with something. There's, there's just this moment that he appoints and he ordains, and we don't always know it. Sometimes he prepares us. Sometimes we, in that uh, relationship be in two ways. Sometimes we come to him and say, I'm setting aside this time to meet with you. And I can assure you of this, he never withholds. The Bible gave us a promise that said, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. That, that's a promise. That's not a sometimes, that's not a maybe if he's in a good mood or if he changes his mind and doesn't want to. That's a promise that if you intentionally set aside a time to seek him and to posture yourself, he will meet with you. It's another thing if you're being Martha and not paying attention to his voice during the visitation. But he promised he would meet with us, and we are intentionally taking uh, next weekend to, um, to do this, to posture ourselves I read this during an outpour recently. This is Numbers chapter 11, verse 18. We've got Israel that's come out of Egypt, and Moses is having a conversation with the Lord. And this is what God tells Moses to tell the people. He says, tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. And that there is this thing called consecration, or there may be other uh, words that we would understand better of what this means, but it really means to set apart, to set aside. But I, I love the intentionality and the faith it takes, right? Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow because something is going to happen tomorrow. And if you can come with that kind of faith, if you can come with that kind of expectancy, there are promises like I've just shared with you, promises of the Lord that says He will meet with you. 
he, won't, he won't not come. That is excellent grammar. He will, meet, he will meet with you. So let's just look at this specific circumstance. Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. <laughs> if only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat and you will eat it. You will not eat it for just one day or two days, or five, ten, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. <laughs> Maybe this was the wrong example to use. <laughs> because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Do you ever feel there are times where you get comfortable in your bondage. You, you make peace with Egypt in your life. And even though the Lord wants to bring you freedom, it's like, you know what? I actually made a home. I was able to cope with coping mechanisms in the bondage that I was in. I don't want to face this is, this is all in regards to this weekend. You know, I, I don't want to face that thing, that trauma, that hurt that happened to me. I'd rather stay in Egypt than step into freedom. And I feel like, one, I want to roar. Two, uh, I'll give my life to raise up a generation that will not settle for Egypt. That I will preach week after week to see a generation that will step into the fullness of what God has for us. Every nook and cranny, every jot and tittle, everything that God has for us, we need to step into. We want to be a generation that will not back down, that will not shrink back, partly because it's not for us and partly because I don't want what happened to Israel to happen to me. <laughs> if, 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 if you read on in the story, it tells you how long uh, and, and how many baskets of meat they filled, like 60 bushels of meat per person. It's, uh, when I, sorry, I should have refreshed myself, like 2.2 kilometers you could walk in any direction, and the meat was like three feet high. There are strange stories in the Bible. <laughs> and I love it because it's easier to remember. <laughs> God always used the, uses extravagant. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if you're Martha and he wants you to hear his voice, he'll give you 30 days of meat, 2.2 2 kilometers in any direction, three feet. I mean, you know, he's, he's got a way of communicating and it's... Uh, it's great. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 21, but Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month? Listen to the lack of faith in, in Moses right here. He, he's doubting that they've been in the desert. How can meat be provided for 600,000 men on foot? for 30 days. So this is what he says. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Moses expresses his heart, and he says, how is this ever going to happen? How can this word of the Lord 
that seems so extravagant and so out there. How, how could this ever come to be? <laughs> Here's how God replies. The Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Yeah. You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. What I want you to see is the word of the Lord comes to Moses. You had a word of the Lord come to you before? God talked to you about your destiny, about what he's called you to, and you realize this looks impossible. Moses' response was to look in the natural. If I caught all the fish in the sea, you know, is that enough to feed them? If we slaughtered every animal we have with us right now, could that feed them? Moses is thinking down here, and God's thinking up here. God's response was not to respond with natural numbers and thoughts. He didn't respond and, and tell Moses, the solution to the problem is this is what I'm going to do. He basically said, your faith cannot be in what you see in the natural. And he says that by saying, is my arm too short? Is your faith in what can happen naturally, even if I do it, or is your faith in me? Is your trust is your trust in what I can do? Is the, arm, is the Lord's arm too short? I love to quote that passage. If your destiny looks impossible, it's almost a sure mark that it's from the Lord. If your destiny looks possible, then you need to question whether the Lord said it to you. Trying to figure out how your destiny has come. I'm guilty of this. It's confession time. <laughs> I'm guilty. I, right now, I'm guilty of this. <laughs> Trying to figure out how the word of the Lord to you and the things that he said is going to come to pass can't happen in the natural mind. It can't, it can't happen by adding up the, the apples. The only way it's going to happen is when you place your whole faith and trust in him and let him do what you can never do on your own. I usually don't like to come and preach to myself and minister to myself. <laughs> I hope that means something to you as well. Let's read a couple more verses. It says, So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. I love that, eh? God comes and speaks to Moses, and Moses, instead of just going and telling it to the people, says, God, I got a few questions first. <laughs> you want me to tell this to the church? I've got a few questions first. How's that going to come to pass? <laughs> the Lord responds. Moses goes and tells the people. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. When the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. Very simply, Moses delivered the word of the Lord. And if you look before, God asked him to do this, to take 70 elders and go to the tent. This tent in my Bible, when it mentions tent, is capital T because it's the tent of meeting. And this, this is what's happening this coming weekend. We're going to gather as a people at the tent of meeting, and we're going to watch what the Lord does. And we're going to encounter everything that God has in his heart for us this coming weekend. The Kairos moments, the weekend that this is going to mark our house, it's going to mark lives. But my encouragement to you, and I'm, I'm going to explain a little more, is let's consecrate ourselves for this upcoming weekend. Take time this week over the next five days before Friday night. Take time just to make sure that your heart and mind are aligned. Take time in prayer. Put extra time on your calendar to spend with the Lord and just make sure that, um, that's, that you're not being Martha. Just make sure that, you, that you're ready to be Mary. 
Turn in your Bibles again with me to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. This word came pretty clear last weekend in preparation for this coming weekend. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 23 and 24, Matthew 5, 23, 24. Are you there? Yes. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. We often compartmentalize our lives in such a way where as we live in community, there are relationships. Iron sharpens iron doesn't always give a good sound. Iron sharpens iron. There's sparks that fly sometimes. And in relationships with each other, there's sometimes hurt. There's offense. There are things that happen. And it's so easy to compartmentalize your life and say, well, this is my life with God, and it's untouchable. And I've got this sphere, my prayer closet, you know, my worship. I got, I got this part at church, and then here's, here's other things where, you know, there's some relationships that may be askew or still some hurt that's being carried on or some bitterness or some trauma from previous relationships or interactions or previous churches. I mean, other pastors, I mean, you fill in the blank. And what struck me, what the Lord spoke to me, was that here's somebody coming to the altar to meet with the Lord. And Jesus said, Jesus said, if someone has something against you, leave your gift. He said, you've come to meet with God and Jesus is saying this. He said, leave your gift. It's not time to meet with God yet. It's time for you to go and deal with this relationship. And then you can come back and give your gift. Is the connection that our horizontal relationships can have with our vertical relationship. Is it possible that there are horizontal relationships that have actually hindered our vertical relationship? Is it possible that there is bitterness and unforgiveness, that there is, you know, there are grudges, that there's offense that's still being held where we think, well, that's, that's that part. That's not with God, and yet Jesus here makes a connection between the relationships and community and the impact of what your encounter will be as you give your gift at the altar to the Lord that apparently there's going to be a difference whether you give your gift first when things aren't right with your brother or sister or when you give it afterwards. <laughs> Candace and I read a book, a uh, marriage book, called Men Are Like Waffles and Women Are Like Spaghetti. <laughs> and uh, speaking as a man, I like waffles, I like spaghetti, um, but the waffle represented how men can really compartmentalize their life, how we're able to actually disengage. In fact, I can actually forget a whole area of my life while I'm focused on another. It's incredible. I have to have a day timer that I look at every single day to make sure I don't, I don't forget something. But God, God joins it together. And he, he has such a big heart for community. In fact, he prays that prayer that says, I wish that they would be one. Right, right before he goes to Calvary, he prays this prayer, I pray that they would be one even as I and the Father are one. Being one in unity and community is more than just smiling at somebody when you walk by them at church. <laughs> as I and the Father are one. What kind of relationship is that? That's the kind of unity and relationship that God has called us to. And you'll say, yeah, but the deeper I go in relationship, you know, the more susceptible I am to getting hurt. Let's, let's talk about that today. 
Let's talk about that. Let me finish talking about this connection first because I'm not pretending like, like I know it all because um, I don't. There's, there's a mystery in there. There's some mystery that I haven't figured out. I know it's true because the Bible says it's true. And as you can see, you know, the words I read, I read are red. The red, red words. I read the red words. I trust the red words. Jesus says, you know, everything boils down to these two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest command. And then he says, and the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. Nowhere in the second is God's name mentioned. But yet, it's like the first. It's like us loving God. Love your, love, it's a mystery. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's like loving God. There's this connection between how we operate in community and our relationship with God. I've got another passage. If you want to turn, you can. Matthew 25. 34 to 40. If you don't want to turn, let me just read it to you. Here's an incredible description of what Jesus means. It says, Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. This is Jesus speaking. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? They're responding saying, I, I never did that. I never did this directly to you, Jesus. When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. It's a bit of a mystery, but it's true. The way we treat each other is, is directly connected to our relationship with Jesus. This Matthew 5 verse that talks about bringing your, your gift to the altar, um, it is possible, again, I'm, I'm not describing the, that I know it all or ascribing to the fact that I I know it all. Here's one thought I'll give you. This verse could be talking about, in, and not the only answer, but it could be talking about heart health. It could be talking about um, Martha, who is distracted, worried, and upset about many things. And when Jesus visited her, when it was her time for visitation, when, when she was in the presence of God, Maybe she didn't have any heart capacity to hear what it was he was saying because she was distracted, worried, and upset. And maybe there are relationships that we have in life right now where we don't have peace about them, where they are taking emotional energy out of here, where there is hurt and there is pain because things aren't right. But, but that's an area of your heart that's supposed to be for him but it's occupied by somebody else. And when you hold unforgiveness and bitterness and grudges, when you have something against your brother or sister, it takes up space in your heart that's for him. And it's like Jesus said, leave your gift here because if you gave it now, that area of your heart, I, I wouldn't be able to minister to. Go and make things right and then come and I'll fill all the space.
What if the bitterness and unforgiveness we're holding against someone is affecting our relationship with God? It is a possibility. So let's look at just a couple of factors in community. I want to talk about two things mainly and talk about how we can prepare our hearts for the upcoming weekend. Let's just start with... um, Let's just start with, the, with love, with the love of God. Being able to carry God's uh, love for people, sharing his heart and his opinion for all people. It's his heart that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. We know that. We know there are certain principles. We know the unconditional love of God in certain areas. We know that when the woman was caught in adultery, instead of guilt, shame, and judgment, he saved her life showed her an unconditional love that I believe transformed her and changed her. I believe there is a love of God that can baptize our lives, that can minister to us. When we encounter that unconditional love of God, we can then share it in community and live it out in community. I've always loved the verse that says, um, you know, it's in two different places. It says, love covers a multitude of sins. In another place, it says, love covers a multitude of wrongs. That means that somebody can offend you and love can be the greater reality. That means that somebody can be having a bad day and say something snarky to you, but your love for that person actually covers over that wrong. It covers over that sin. (laughs) Love covers a multitude of sins, a multitude of wrongs. In essence, it's, it's saying that love is the greatest force on the face of the earth. Instead of saying uh, offense has kept you bound, it says love covers over everything. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Jesus and, and Peter, I've referenced this at least four times this year. At the end of the Gospel of John, it boils down to do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Jesus knew what the connecting point and the connecting factor of relationships was. And he proved it in that conversation to say it's all about love. Here we are at the end of the book. Here we are after a denial of Jesus here we are with Peter weighed down with these things. And Jesus decides, because it's the truth that love is the connecting factor, that love is the greatest agent in relationships, that the love of God is the only way you can make it in community and human relationships. Peter, do you love me? He knows that it's the agent that can solve every relational problem. That love is the greatest force. When you've experienced the unconditional love of God, your value and your identity isn't threatened by other people's opinions of you. When you know what God thinks about you, when you know how much you're valued, when other people try to devalue you, it doesn't have to hurt your heart. Your relationship with that person may not be all that it could be, but it doesn't have to affect your heart. Your identity is dictated by the Lord. Nobody else. Your identity is dictated by who created you because he knows why you were created. He created you exactly the way he wanted you. And when other people give their opinions about your identity or who you are, they don't have the right to dictate who you should or shouldn't be. There's one person that has that right. But when you've had that encounter with the unconditional love of God and you know your value and you know your identity, you're able to move into spheres of 
people that may, that have the potential to hurt you. You're able to move in those spheres and you're able to release unconditional love to a hurting people. This is important because this is a strategy of God. This is a strategy of, of heaven. It moves, beyond, um, it moves beyond just you and church relationship. When you know your identity and your value, you can go to people that are hurt, that are traumatized. They may throw spears at you. They may shoot arrows at you. They may give remarks to you, but they don't have to land. You can continue to love them with an unconditional love. This is the way that Jesus moved. It's the way he operated because he knew his identity and his value from his Father. So there is a measure beyond in which you can you can live, it's actually a measure that the church has been called to because the only way we're going to go into the community and love people that hate Christians is to be unoffendable. It's to be so full of the unconditional love of God that they're throwing spears at you and you're saying, just give me a hug. <laughs> they're cursing you and you're blessing them. It's the only way to reflect the unconditional love of God in the earth today is to carry it in that manner to them. Sometimes people won't see God's forgiveness until they see your forgiveness. We've got to continue to love people in the face of hate and rejection. This is, this is good. This is what Matthew 5.44 says. But I say to you, love your enemies... That's a specific choice of word, by the way. It doesn't just say love a stranger. Love the person that's bad mouth in your ministry. Love the person that's attacking your theology and doctrine. Love the person that's actually dead set against you. If God didn't love Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who was an enemy of the church, if he didn't love him with unconditional love, he never would have become the Apostle Paul. Love your enemies. Easier said than done, I know. Love your enemies. But it's possible. That's what I'm telling you today. There is a love of God to baptize your life that will radically trans transform you and, and what you can do and where you can go. One of the things I'm praying for this upcoming weekend is that there's just a baptism in the love of God, that you encounter God face to face in a manner where you know you've never been unloved. His love is 110% pointed towards you in your direction. Sorry, Matthew 5, 44. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This sounds like the type of community that we run away from. Yet God is saying, this is the type of community that you can minister in. This is the type of community that you can go in and transform with the love of God. The enemies curse you, hate you, spitefully use you, and persecute you. We have a great destiny. My identity is in Christ so that I can handle other people's judgments and persecutions. Being unoffendable you may have an opinion if being unoffendable is possible or not. No matter what you believe about if it's possible to live life without being offended or being offended in relationship, if you can love your enemies and not be offended by your enemies, if being offendable is a possibility, and if you don't believe it is, then whenever somebody says something that hurts your heart, the really good news is we know somebody whose name is the healer. And not a moment has to go by from when that arrow was shot at you that you have to let that arrow stick in you. You can take it straight to him and he'll take it straight out. And he'll remind you of who you are, your value, your worth. 
there are things that we have carried for far too long. A day doesn't have to go by if somebody has mistreated you or badmouthed you that that hurt has to stay in your life. A day doesn't have to go by. He is the healer, capital H. It's not, it's not a side job. It's, it's what he does. He heals hearts. He heals lives. He speaks the truth. The power of God's healing is greater than any hurt you could ever experience. The power of his love is greater than any rejection you could ever face. In fact, our ability to receive healing assists us in releasing forgiveness. We hold people accountable because of the hurt that we're feeling. We feel that by withholding forgiveness is actually making them pay for the hurt that they caused us while we continue to hold on to the hurt. Freedom is in releasing it. Let's look quickly at forgiveness and, and we'll close. The cross was Jesus' mission. He came to introduce a new covenant, but he came to pay a price. He came to give his life so that he could restore relationship. He came to offer forgiveness. If forgiveness is one of the main things, the main factors that came out of Jesus' sacrifice, then it's something that's probably pretty important. I'll just throw that out there to start. <laughs> it's pretty important, and it's also one of the greatest blessings that we could ever experience, one, from God, two, from others, and three, to forgive ourselves because He's forgiven us. Forgiveness is absolutely essential for any community to function. Look, even if the person who hurts you is justifiably in the wrong, it still doesn't give you the right to take offense and withhold forgiveness. Even if the person who hurts you is justifiably in the wrong, it still doesn't give you the right to take offense and withhold forgiveness. Calvary made forgiveness the new way of life. Because he has forgiven you, you can forgive others. Because he has forgiven me, forgiveness is now the new way of life that I extend to everybody. Sometimes, I'll just throw this in as a side note, sometimes we take offense to something that is true. Sometimes we're offended by truth. Jesus was called the rock of offense. Grace can be quite offensive when the woman caught in adultery deserves by the law to be killed, but is shown unconditional love and grace. That offends some people. It may offend you to forgive the person that caused you so much hurt, and that's why you've held on to it, hoping that they would pay the price for how much they hurt you. Jesus offended many people, many times, but he was never in the wrong. Just a side note. Let's talk very quickly. This deserves a better treatment, but let's talk very quickly about the words judgment and justice, because this is really important. Sometimes our perspective on what judgment and justice are, are not God's perspective. When people gather stones to kill a woman caught in adultery because that's what the law says, they thought that judgment was correct. That, that's a correct judgment that they made to kill this woman, and yet Jesus stepped in and said, I'm going to show her grace and unconditional love. I'm going to show her something that will transform her life. Do you know that uh, not guilty is a judgment as well? I may get myself in trouble for a bit. We talk about Judgment Day. 
the coming judgment, and it's true, but do you know that not guilty is just as much of a judgment as guilty is? Do you know that not guilty may be a more, a more popular judgment than you think at the moment? Do you know that the cross and Calvary has made not guilty a very popular judgment? He who is without sin cast the first stone. Yet there's a lot of judgment that abides in churches across the earth today. A lot of judgment that isn't our place to hand out. A lot of judgment that when, when we get offended, we feel we have to exercise judgment against somebody. When Jesus said, love covers a multitude of sin. Forgiveness is the better way. Jesus stands up in the solemn assembly and he makes this declaration. They're reading scripture, they read out of Isaiah. Jesus stands up and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he talks about all the things that are going to happen with that spirit of the Lord upon him. But one of the things he says is to proclaim that prisoners will be released. Prisoners will be released. Those who are justifiably in the wrong are going to experience grace. Those that have broken the law are going to experience a freedom that is brought about by the unconditional love of God. One of the most amazing places that Jesus shows this on his way to Calvary is when the crowd is there and the declaration is, do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And here you've got this, uh, the greatest contrast you could probably have between, you know, God in the flesh, right, a, a human who gave up his divinity to come as, as God in the flesh, l to live as a man, fully God, fully man. And you've got Barabbas, you, you've got the sinless man, the best of the best, and you've got Barabbas, a murderer someone that's partnered with the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy. You've got the worst of the worst. And what happens? Barabbas goes free, and Jesus takes his place. And he's done that for every one of us, so that we can do that for everyone that hurts us. He let the worst of the worst go free because of grace, because of unconditional love so that we can live lives of forgiveness, so that we can live lives outside of our prisons, outside of the chains of bitterness and bondage and unforgiveness and holding grudges and being hurt. Sometimes our ideas of judgment and just, justice are not the same as God's. Sometimes our thoughts of judgment and justice sound more like revenge than God's heart of repentance and restoration. We don't want to end up being like the sons of thunder that are simply calling down fire on cities. Jesus said, sorry, that's not the way we operate anymore. That's not the way my kingdom operates anymore. We're not calling down judgment unto destruction. We're calling down repentance and restoration. Let me finish with this, with this thought. Just, I wanted to give you so many examples today. Want to make sure your heart's healthy for the weekend. Want to make sure you're not living under the bondage of the enemy. You're not living under the bondage of those that have hurt you. The reality is, is, hey, we live in community. Nobody has perfect behavior. Your account says righteous because of Jesus. But we don't always behave according to our identity. There is the possibility of someone being snarky. There is the possibility of gossip. There is the possibility of betrayal and these things. Yet I, I want to leave you with this picture. We've got, we've got Stephen. 
Stephen makes this incredible speech in the book of Acts, and now he's being stoned for his faith in God. And here's Stephen um, physically being harmed and beaten, being stoned to death. And what comes out of his mouth? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. See, Stephen had a revelation because he spent time with Jesus. He not only carried Jesus' heart for mankind to be able to look the person that's killing him in the face and, and ask God to forgive them. Like, that's the epitome of, of living the way that Jesus has called us to live. Where the people, your enemies, your persecutors, the attackers, the ones that hate you, the ones that curse you, are trying to kill you. Maybe they're trying to, right, trying to kill your ministry, trying to damage your family, damage your marriage. And yet Stephen responds, knowing who he is and knowing who his God is, and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that statement, they know not what they do, is a deeper revelation that Stephen carried a deep understanding of God's heart, an understanding that we need to carry, a revelation that we need to understand about mankind and just the nature of community and relationship, but to still be able to operate from that source of God's unconditional love, identity and value and acceptance, and be in that place. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? I just want, Father, right now, would you just move on hearts? Would you just let the seed of your word, of your voice right now, penetrate hearts? You may be here today and you don't want to give up the hurt. You've been comfortable in Egypt. You want to hold on to that hurt because you feel you're justified to. You feel like it's your right to. You've become comfortable in carrying the hurt. Maybe you've adopted a, a victim mentality in which other people now treat you with more compassion and more attention because of the hurt that you carry. But you're not free. You're not free. You're not free. And Jesus wants you free. Jesus paid a price to set you free. The other thing that hurt is doing, if you're holding on to it, it's withholding your impact in the community. Instead of being somebody that has received the forgiveness and freedom of God and then having the testimony, like the woman at the well, the testimony to then take that freedom that you've encountered from the Lord and spread it to other people. Maybe there are other people that are waiting for you to finally give this up to come into freedom so that you can lead them into freedom. But by holding on to your hurt, you're actually withholding ministry to other people. I can tell you today, there is a love of God that I hope you've experienced, but you haven't. There is a love of God that will transform your life. Every burden, every weight, every hurt, Every word that has attached itself to your life will break off in a moment when you feel the tangible love of God come over your life, when you know who you are, what you've been called to. This message about forgiveness today, it's not about guilt and shame. I'm not trying to guilt you into releasing forgiveness. It's not about that. It's about being free. It's about my heart for you to be free to experience everything that Jesus paid for on Calvary. To step into the fullness of your purpose and your destiny by releasing the things that are holding you back. A couple weeks ago, we talked about throwing off everything that hinders. Everything that hinders. Today's the day to do it. Today's the day to do it. Jesus has released forgiveness over every area of your life. Everything. The nastiest, dirtiest, darkest things in your life have been forgiven through the cross of Calvary so you can forgive that person that hurt you. 
this week there is an opportunity. You know what I'm talking about in your life. You know, stop shoving it into the corner. (laughs) You know what God's addressing this morning. You know what he's putting his finger on. And you know now what you need to do. We're just going to end the service. There'll be a ministry team here. We're going to end the service, but I'm going to pray for you first.